We are very fortunate to have Dr. K. Kasturi Rankan, who is the face of success in Indian Space Research Organization, not only in the last decade, but perhaps in the history of this organization. I'm so glad to introduce you to him. He's the director of this institute, National Institute of Advanced Studies, and he is the honorable member of parliament, Rajya Sabha. Dr. Rankan has steered the Indian Space Program gloriously for over nine years as chairman of the Indian Space Research Organization of Space Commission and secretary to the Government of India in the Department of Space before laying down his office on August 27, 2003. He was earlier the director of ISRO Satellite Center where he oversaw the activities related to the development of a new generation spacecraft, Indian National Satellite, INSAT-2, and Indian Remote Sensing Satellites, IRS-1A and 1B, as well as scientific satellites. As an astrophysicist, Dr. Rankin's interest includes research in high energy X-ray and gamma ray astronomy, as well as optical astronomy. He has made extensive and significant contributions to studies of cosmic X-ray sources, celestial gamma ray, and effect of cosmic X-rays in the lower atmosphere. Dr. Kasturi Rankin is a member of several important scientific academies, both within and ab abroad. This includes, he is the chairman of the Council of the Indian Institute of Science and Raman Research Institute, both in this, in, in this uh, Bangalore, city of Bangalore. And he's also the chairman of the governing council of Adibata Research Institute of Observational Sciences at Nainital. He is also the president of the Indian National Academy of Engineering, Dr. Kasturi Rankin. Good morning, and first I would like to thank you for the very pleasant entry that uh, I experienced uh, when I came into the room. And I think the first lines of the uh, of the performer, Shah Mastani, I think that is the spirit in which, of course, I will also deliver my talk. I have not got any slides or anything, nor do I propose to uh, give too much of others' experiences. It, it is really my own experience of how the Indian Space Program has evolved as somebody who has watched it uh, during the 40 years in several capacities. And to give you a flavor of how an organization evolves right from the scratch, scratch I should say, and with uh, no benchmarking, and then grows and evolves and then becomes one among the world's six, and in many areas, the world's number one. So what, have, what, what is it that drives this kind of a system into that direction? I'll try to convey the flavor of this. I don't think that uh, everything is possible to say in the next uh, 40, 45 minutes. But I think it's important to just know how the people who are responsible for this, how they looked at things. Uh, first, uh, the pioneer of the Indian space program, uh, Professor Vikram Sarabhai and uh, you know I happened to be a student during the times of Sarabhai so I was at the physical research laboratory the cradle of the Indian space program uh, but we were all watching from uh, the thing that is evolving under Sarabhai's uh, uh, pioneering concepts of uh, starting this program and uh, then so that was uh, student day so your inclusiveness is more but it was really a very nice thing that you were sitting right inside that cradle where the space program was evolving and then came the uh, uh, so he was building up then as a person who was professionally involved in the space program at the level of directing projects and so on i worked with satish Dhawan. and then as a person who headed a major center like the ISRO Satellite Center, I worked with UR Rao. And then I took over as the chairman in the final uh, nine, nine years or nine and a half years. So you can see that uh, there is a gradual evolution of my own exposure to an evolving system. And uh, of course, the outlook also of mine was changing correspondingly. It is one outlook when you are a student, another outlook when you have to deliver certain things in a certain time. And then when you are in overall charge, you have another outlook. And lastly, when you head an organization, it's a very different kind of a thing. So there are four phases in which the whole thing happened. But I, I would just uh, come to how Sarah, by the first uh, sideline uh, watch of what happened to the Sprague program in the early years. 
you know he the, the sputnik was just launched 1957 and in the launch of sputnik he saw that there is something very unique about the vantage point of space in the context of development and uh, so you know he was a visionary he was not just seeing this as an extension of the cold war uh, between two superpowers the united states and the soviet union but he saw in it as a very interesting prospect for this country a country which is developing where the infrastructure in many areas like communications timely information on natural resources education literacy healthcare in all these he found that there is a potential for this vantage point to be used and uh, but then how do you develop this that was the first point but then he took a natural course here was a natural resource a tumba where the geomagnetic equator passes through and he thought that at least i can start with some experiments which could fulfill the scientists were ready to use this kind of a facility but as the rest of the nation in terms of applications was not so he first introduced the space into the indian scene indian scene by bringing in scientists creating a rocket launching base putting the sounding rockets and studying the upper atmosphere over that region which is a very interest which there is which is a very interesting uh, implications in terms of uh, geophysics so he did this now when he did this what he was really trying to do is one is to propel science support the scientific community and give them a unique opportunity on the other side what he was trying to do was to create a set of people men and women who could uh, use you who could start working out a strategy for developing the technology itself the technology the rockets technology of instrumentation and the whole host of technology that goes with the rocket so there is a research component and uh, by all that but the important thing in this context is that there is a single objective like flying a rocket conducting an experiment and that objective needs a variety of endeavors it could be in the engineering a multidisciplinary it could be building a rocket which is materials which is aerodynamics control systems navigation systems instrumentation physics and then you have to bring them as a team so a culture he was developing of working on interdisciplinary programs creating a culture of a team working together and then trying to aim at a single objective so all these kind of a thing which was forming as a culture even as he started this very modest efforts of building up the capability for carrying out the scientific experiments and of course he also encouraged research in this phase of the program and he encouraged research not only to ensure that we are always we which we should be able to take ourselves up to the cutting edge of science and technology but equally importantly research is one way in which you can build up international linkages without much of formalities and other kinds of geopolitical considerations so he decided that let us have a good research program which would invite scientists from different parts of the world to work together and certainly tumba is an excellent example of how many nations came together once the research and scientific component was the primary goal when we started with this you have united states which participated by giving rockets and some instruments you had the european the france which gave us uh, a certain type of instruments the germany which came out with uh, certain support in terms of conducting experiments and then of course the russians the soviet union at that time they gave us helicopter minsk computers and so on so you see that there was an international component to this initiative again due to his vision that only through this kind of a step i can bring in the international community and then of course he formed the next step that i cannot just leave it at the uh, launching of rocket from tumba he started the space science and technology where he started scaling up this culture in terms of a team shift a team management in terms of a multidisciplinary research and development in terms of having single goals like a launch vehicle and then trying to provide all the support around people who had the necessary capability whom he invited from all over the world to start this kind of activity so there was a human resource uh, development effort that went into it and uh, this this period also witnessed in sarabai's times not only the capability of rockets capability of human resource and so on he also introduced cultures which are very critical to the space program you know space program unlike many other program as a high risk program you have always the question of whether you succeed or you don't succeed and the difference between a success and a failure could be a very thin uh, separation uh, it could be just that somebody failed to put the screw properly and tighten it and that could be as bad as that 
so what do you do you have to you have to bring in the fact that people should and people in this country you know they would like to have a job which is less risky which is a little more secure little more safe and so against that kind of a culture how do you bring in people who could take responsibilities in areas which are provided you are faced with risks so there is another important thing that uh, he tried to bring in in fact i do vividly remember an incident where in a single night four rockets were fired and out of the four uh, actually three rockets were fired out of the four all the three failed and uh, then i happened to be a student in the physical research laboratory he just uh, i happened to cross him the next day after this debacle at uh, tumba and he just laughingly asked as the spanish armada come back and uh, then when he asked this question he was of course having a smile in his face but i understood that after going back to his room he called the concerned people and gave them a real dressing down but at the same time he encouraged them that you have to find the reasons for this problem you have to correct it and the program cannot have a setback because of this and he encouraged them to th- t- take this he also allowed these people in the early phase of the program to think big this was the time and i am talking of 60s when even talking of 10 uh, 5 lakhs or 10 lakhs was considered as a big uh, big uh, money but he encouraged all these people to think in terms of crores and simply because of the fact they knew the space program does invest uh, require a lot of investment but more importantly as managers within the indian system of science and technology you had to get habituated to deal with big money big uh, big programs think big and ultimately make sure also that this everything is big but you have to also have that mentality to take risk and succeed all these kind of cultures which are so critical to evolve the early part of the space program he introduced into the whole system in fact there is another thing in which uh, somebody uh, jokingly asked him that uh, the budget had just climbed in the very first year to 4 crores and uh, somebody went and why are you spending this taxpayers money sir he was actually a person who whom you could freely interact and meet and you can even criticize him he takes it in the right spirit and so he was asked why are you spending this 4 crores which is the taxpayers money and why are you wasting it and he laughingly said who's money i it is all my money i pay more than 4 crores taxes to the government so you can assume that it is my tax that i am using to spend this for the space program so you know he had that kind of a mentality when it comes to it but so he was an incredible person he he had this attitude he had the attitude of looking at the vision not even beyond space you know he created the first institute of at ahmedabad the indian institute of management he created the ahmedabad textile industries research association he was also the in charge of a big industrial empire so you have a very holistic a person with a very holistic view of many things and it sort of the program well that he was the first person to deal with the program i think it's a very significant thing that happened to the indian space program now from this early phase the next question came up of what is the way in which we move from this Uh, you cannot obviously put quite a lot of money into satellites because it has not been proven that the satellite is the best means of doing the development you have the conventional systems and if at all the satellite systems would be the uh, kind of thing that would supplement and complement the conventional system so it was decided that we use systems which have been built abroad and uh, so the site experiment the satellite instructional television experiment which used an american satellite atsf advanced technology satellite or the landsat system the satellite that was used for remote sensing and you know remote sensing is a very good concept of looking and taking pictures from space uh, to look at the natural resources on the ground whether it is agriculture water resources environment geology and so on so you use this kind of a thing so he decided that we will try to get these satellites use their services build the ground systems which are tuned to the indian needs and also bring in a large amount of user community which is outside the space uh, people who are who could use this like that people in the communications area people in the broadcasting area people in education uh, people in healthcare uh, people in natural resources like the forestry people or hydrology people so he brought these people together asked them to look at the use of these kind of systems and services and data and see how that could improve the efficiency of the conventional approaches to dealing with this so this is here is the first time he introduced the concept of a science and technology system being brought into to interface with the users and which are the users who are outside the system so this is another concept that he produced 
And uh, so having done this and having demonstrated this successfully, the third phase of the program started. The first phase was just to create the initial elements and also to test it out through the proof of concept where we use the foreign systems. And the second one was to see how we could bring the users and also work closely with the user community, give them the familiarity of the use of these kind of system and also at the same time make these systems relevant from the point of view of the nation and not with respect to the relevance of the space itself for the internally for the program. So that these are the kind of things that was done. And so the next obvious step was how do we go to a kind of a self-reliance? Obviously, it was, it was becoming clear by this time that uh, these kind of systems can make a lot of difference to the development of the country. So how, do, how are we going to deal with this system? Uh, so you have to have some betting, you have to wet your hands with uh, the initial uh, experiments that you can do. You can uh, develop a capability to build on an end-to-end -end basis certain system not cost effective to be done within a certain time frame and you demonstrate the capability of an internal self-reliance internal capability be consistent with the self-reliance and so he can they, the two experimental systems were conceived in this time frame what you have you would have known already an apple an area and passenger payload experiment and a satellite called Bhaskara both these systems were conceived more to build a low cost space segment, a space segment which can be built in a reasonable time frame, which had a limited applications with respect to the users who are interested in using this and will ultimately could pave way for operational system if their efficacy is demonstrated. So that was the purpose within which these experimental systems were built. So that was the genesis of Bhaskara and Apple and they, were, they succeeded. Then finally, it went into the final operational era, what we call as the current era of space program, where you have a satellite system that provide routine services to a variety of applications, and you are quite familiar, many of you are quite familiar with the type of subsystem systems that provide communication support from space, the INSAT series of systems, broadcasting capability, in fact, 60 to 70 percent of the national broadcasting today is conducted through the INSAT system. It is one of the largest domestic satellite communication systems in the world today. And yesterday I know that you had the chance to visit the master control facility, uh, which is one of the facilities which controls that kind of a thing. In fact, the, the, even though we have put something like 50 or 60 million dollars on the ground system, you should imagine that it is controlling an asset worth something like 2 billion dollars in the international market, 6 to 7 satellites, which are currently in the orbit, including the most recent one. So you can see the type of investments today it has graduated into in terms of the type of systems that have been built and deployed in space, all with indigenous capability of design and development. But when it was initially demonstrated through the site that this kind of a system could be a very potential use for communication, education and many other applications. And the question of what is the time frame in which such a system could be built by the country itself was found and by that time Sadish Dhawan had taken over. It was found that it's not very easy to build these systems in the matter of two to three years and be introduce these services. And ISRO took a very pragmatic decision and I am, I am giving this also as an example of certain type of decisions that are made in the department where ultimately introduction of these kind of services using high-tech systems gets a priority in term uh, compared to whether you want to build it in the country, take your own time frame to build it and therefore introduce the services according to that time frame. Here is where the leadership of ISRO took very pragmatic decision of a buy-build options and they exercised this very judiciously in the context of the program and uh, therefore the first series of insats were bought and deployed, the four of them were bought and deployed, even as India started building its own second generation. And yesterday what you saw, the latest one would have been the fourth generation of the satellite, but the second, third and fourth generations were all built within the country. But after the first generation, which was also an operational system that was bought from abroad. So that is the way in which it went. So the Indian, the satellite was built, 
the insat series today is as i told you is one of the largest systems in the world and uh, this has been put uh, put together uh, to provide these kind of critical services many of which i don't want to elaborate but i'm really trying to provide you a glimpse of the type of strategy that was adopted but in the case of the remote sensing satellite unlike the communication satellite this is not easily available abroad uh, and secondly the systems are such that one could easily tune whereas the insat system had to be tuned to specific national needs the remote sensing satellite even when you try to get build it abroad or a global system like the one that us built landsat it could be also used by india so the question was whether we could introduce the remote sensing as a capability uh, space based observation for earth resources survey if using satellites from outside even as we try to build our own so that's where the strategy was adopted that we build the remote sensing satellite on our own even if it takes a little more time and the time available at that the time that is needed could be anywhere up to 6 to 8 years but at the same time you introduce the services for those kind of systems by trying to use other systems which are available abroad and which could be also allowed to which also as per the agreement could be ena could enable us to acquire the data from those systems so this was the strategy that was adopted in the context of the remote sensing system we build our own the the third part of course is the new newer application so remote sensing communications broadcasting meteorology they were all central to the india space program it continues to be central to the space program and substantial portion of this is the socially oriented developmental oriented because it was re realized both by sarabhai and dhawan that if you have to have more and more investment and what started as few crores of investment today is nearly 4000 crores in a year if one has to graduate to this level of investment and you need to have a level of program which is tuned to the country's needs obviously substantial component has to be justified in the context of development and the whole strategy of developing the space program spun around this kind of a strategy of building systems which are applicable to the developmental component that is where you see the earth resources use of the system for agriculture timely information related to the crop production mensuration of forests looking at the environment creation of hydro geo morphological map for looking at the ground water surface water mapping geological applications coast coast uh, coastal processes fisheries so one can see the level to which today the space system especially the, in the case of remote sensing for example have penetrated in trying to provide inputs in the context of development the same thing is applicable in the context of communications 50 to 60% of the communication today go through the space systems whereas of course another 30 through the terrestrial systems and in addition to that of course this communication systems today are used for education and healthcare telemedicine and so on and then ultimately of course the communication systems is also used for broadcasting the outreach of almost 70 to 88 in fact almost the, the outreach to the population today in terms of the capability is almost 90% and 65 to 70% of the geographical area of the country is covered by the communication broadcasting systems with uh, space based satellites so one can see the outreach today by these kind of systems so it, that has been all very well uh, settled the third the, i said about the buy and bought that was one of the thing the second uh, major decision in the early part of the program which is of also of interest to you was the developmental time frame for launch vehicle and the developmental time frame for satellites it so happens you don't get the level of information that you get for satellite even that is not available for the launch vehicle intrinsically complex technology had to be developed right from the scratch and then you had to face the several questions which are particularly related to sanctions the mtc missile technology control regimes Uh, questions of getting getting materials under many other kind of inhibiting regimes that the developed countries put on this country so these one has to face those kind of a thing and obviously it was clear that the launch vehicle program which can support launching our own satellite indigenously if we have to dovetail with the launch satellites we are going to have our own time frame for this here again a deliberate decision was made that and we develop we go on our own on the launch vehicle 
But until we have our launch vehicle for specific uh, applications like putting a remote sensing satellite into a polar orbit or a communication satellite into a geosynchronous orbit, until we develop the capability for it within a certain limit or constraints, we as well go for buying the launch vehicles from outside and get our satellite launched. So there was another major decision. So the whole strategy, if you see in these kind of decisions, is that nothing, you give primacy to applications, applications which are related to development, and you give primary, primacy to time in which you want to introduce it. If there are gaps between the time frame of one system with respect to the other system in matching to realize the ultimate goal, you decouple those systems, take decisions specifically for one area even as you progress the other area and ultimately become a self-reliant, total self-reliant system at another point in time rather than driving all the things together, not finding a meeting point and you have seen programs in this country where those kind of things ultimately have resulted in delays which could substantially be, it could be anywhere about 10 years and 15 years and still you don't see the light of the day. So this was one area which was avoided, the decision making system within the space program avoided these kind of pitfalls in the way in which a system can hold up an overall program and an overall ability for the country by decoupling at, at the right point and taking pragmatic decisions even though it may look as if we are buying something at that particular point why are we going and buying but the choice is between having a system under your control or to have it at a time when it would have probably even lost its meaning so that that was avoided in the in the various steps in the decision making policies were always tuned for these kind of things but most important with respect to the policy is you need to build, when you introduce a new system in this country, you need to have a set of users. And the users primarily, you know, in these kind of systems in the early part of the space program, and I'm telling of 70s, 80s, and even 90s, were mostly government. In fact, 95% to 98% of the space systems are used by the government, uh, including the defense. And so obviously you need to create a structure, even though you may say that this is used by the government, it is not very easy to create the necessary institutions within the government to take the space capability and integrate them into their conventional system. And what I mean by this is suppose you have a ministry, the agriculture ministry. They have their patwari system for ultimately deciding how much of uh, production of wheat is there, how much of production of rice is there. Of course, the patwari system gives you six months after the harvest the information. Here you say that I can give you a prediction within one month before the harvest at 90% or 90, 90%, 90% accuracy and precision as the Bureau of Economics and Statistics may need or even 95% by 95%. But then how do you introduce that into their system? That is, that is one of the things. So that is what you call as institutionalization. Same thing when it comes to exploring water. Same thing when it comes to using the forest mensuration, inventory, and so on. So here is what, and also same thing, when you talk of communication, they will say, okay, we have terrestrial links and we will be, microwave links are there and we should be able to use it. So you need to again bring this. Here, there had to be a nexus between the political system, the scientific community related to the space, and ultimately to bring together a large number of user community which are all in the different departments of the government of India. So this is where Professor Dhawan played a very crucial role and at that time the Prime Minister of course was Madam Gandhi who supported him to the hilt. The two or three major systems that came into picture as institutions to use the space uh, in the context of a governmental department is one was the INSAT Coordination Committee, a committee which consisted of secretaries to the government in communications, information, broadcasting, meteorology, and defense. And of course, the space secretary chairs this kind of a committee. So this was one of them. The second was a national natural resource management system, a, a committee of again secretaries chaired by the member, uh, secretary of some member, the science and technology of the planning commission. And you know, under the planning commission, you have the major responsibility related to the resources. So he was the chairman of this. And all the secretaries of the line departments, like the forestry, oceanography, environment, geology, they were all members of this uh, natural national resource management system. And ultimately, they were the one who took the decision of how to integrate the space data into their conventional system to improve the efficiency and efficacy of the resource monitoring and resource management. So this was a very beautiful system that was created. Secretary Space was a member of this particular committee. 
Similarly, there was a committee which related to the topmost scientists in the country who could advise ISRO on the matters of space science. So this was called the Advisory Committee on Space Sciences at COS, that came to be known. And overarching all these was a top body, which is the most important decision-making, something which was on the lines of what Baba created for the atomic energy, the Atomic Energy Commission, a space commission was created. The importance of the Space Commission and that was created at the time of Professor Sadish Dhawan and uh, fully supported by Madam Gandhi was that you don't have to go to the other, other departments of the government for clearances. The Space Commission was an all-encompassing commission, is, is an all-encompassing commission. It is chaired by the Secretary Department of Space. It has the Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister. It has the Cabinet Secretary. It has the finance secretary. These three are the key members of the Space Commission. And then, of course, there are two or three specialists who also serve in the commission. And what is significant is the Space Secretary chairs this commission. And the commission is, has got the charge of responsibility for running the program, overseeing the policies related to it, integration of the space system with the conventional system, approving the budgets, approving the plans and programs. And virtually, you don't go through finance ministry, you don't go through cabinet secretariat, you don't go through many other routes which are typical of the bureaucratic element that one brings in in trying to get clearances and decision making within the country. This was all done away with, as Baba called it earlier, you do away with the inelastic rules which otherwise was impeding the quick decision making. So this is a very, very, very powerful and effective means of decision making which also aided the space program in terms of trying to progress and making decisions a little more straightforward and at the same time, of course, accountable. So these are some of the institutions that were set up within the governmental system to run the space program, to integrate it with the rest of the governmental system, and also to identify the policies, programs, and directions for these activities. Now let me give some examples of the type of challenges that we met in trying to build these kind of systems. Uh, I don't want to go into many things, but I said that uh, we had to build our own launch vehicles in terms of uh, uh, ultimately a policy which is consistent with our own outlook of self-reliance. And the self-reliance uh, was primarily because of the fact that uh, we ultimately have to be independent of support from outside in this kind of areas. The geopolitics does play a very important role in the context of cooperation and collaboration in space. I will say a few words about it a little later. So obviously the self-reliance was treated as an important policy of the India's uh, space program. So one had to develop and what is the core requirement that the country has to be self-reliant was that we should be able to build our own communication satellites. We should be able to design and develop our own remote sensing satellites and ultimately we should be able to launch them with our own launch vehicles. So this is the core capability at least the India should have in trying to ensure that we have a self-reliant program which will be transparent to the vicissitudes of the geopolitical situations. So this is what uh, had to be done. So the development, as you know, had to be dovetailed, it had to be decoupled and all kinds of things I mentioned as uh, strategies to ensure that the program itself is moving. Uh, but there are, there are very interesting things that happen in the whole process. Uh, we had to build this remote sensing satellite and we were launching it with the Soviet Union. They gave us uh, reasonably good launchers and uh, at the same time very cost effective uh, when, the Soviet, when it was still Soviet Union and not uh, Russia. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, we, we, when we started developing the polar satellite launch vehicle, the analog of the system that they use for putting it into the orbit, uh, we had a certain time frame and we had a certain capability and the capability that we set for ourselves, uh, because otherwise again it could stretch the time too much, we had to be pragmatic in specifying a specification, but at the same time in tune with the type of satellites that we want to launch. So the PSLV was something like a 1 to 1.2 tons. And we wanted to build a world-class remote sensing satellite around that capability. Then we found that if you want to build a world-class satellite, one has to talk of something like Landsat or the SPOT, 
the French satellite. And they were all in the two, two and a half ton class. And much of the two, two and a half ton class because of the fact that you have a fairly large camera system which is nearly a ton. And so if you want to go the way in which they went, developing optics, detectors and the rest of the system, obviously you are talking of a two ton class. And when you talk of a two ton class of a satellite, obviously the PSLV cannot carry it. So there is going to be a terrific mismatch between the time frame in which our own remote sensing satellites could be launched by ourselves. And there was this other problem also. We are getting moving into higher and higher resolution. And as you go to 5 meter and 1 meter and sub meter, the chances of it getting launched from outside is going to be next to nil. Because nobody will like to put such a satellite for India into the orbit. So there was an imperative that we still make our satellites compatible with our launch vehicle. The interesting point was we found that the camera systems that have been developed for this has to be much smaller, much more compact in volume and weight, and at the same time should have a technological capability which is similar to what they have done in US and you know, France. That was a very interesting challenge that was posed to our scientists. They looked at the optical system, they looked at a variety of configurations, and they knew such systems are just not available and not even there in the records of anybody who have having thought about. But they were all looked into, several options were worked, several simulations were carried out, and out came with the optical group in Ahmedabad, the Space Application Center, that there are solutions which could provide you a compactness, they can provide you with the type of performance that the best of the satellites have and at the same time in a weight class where we could make our satellites meaningful vis-a-vis -vis our own launch vehicle. That was a very, very tricky development but a very challenging one but ultimately a highly innovative approach which our engineers and technical so as technologists and scientists achieved. And these cameras, of course, and the variants of it became the mainstay of the IRS system. Actually, what happened is that the first set of those cameras, when they were flown, and the satellite itself finally became nearly at just a ton, uh, we had a capability which became comparable to the French and the Americans. We went into the next generation of these cameras, improved their capability, and we could put a uh, suit of cameras which could provide a per per permutation, common permutation and combination. It can provide several applications we found that we had a superior combination of system uh, compared to even the best of the satellite operating at that time. So by the second generation, we had a superior system. In the third generation, we have now l become a leader in this particular total area of remote sensing from space. And in fact, the recent launch of the Cartosat, the first of its kind in the world, uh, in a way testifies to India's preeminence and leadership. All I can say is that here was an opportunity to innovate. Here was an opportunity to be original. And in the process of trying to be original, because you didn't have any benchmark and you did not have a way to fall back on others' know-how, you had to be on your own. And when you did this, within two generations of such a system, you became the world leader. And it is now the challenge is only to keep that leadership alive and keep it going. And that we are doing now. So you, by doing this kind of a thing, it also shows that when you go for an indigenous route in a pragmatic way and uh, try to put the best of the teams and give them a challenging job like this, this country can be second to none in terms of their ability to deliver the best systems in the world. And uh, what is also in the whole process, you become a leader because you have not been influenced by what others did. So, so once you become influenced by what others do, you always keep waiting for what they are going to do further before you yourself start doing that. So you become led. In this particular case, we clearly demonstrated that we are a leader and we are not led by other ideas and other concepts. We may use the best of the ideas from other sources. But by and large, it was an Indian effort, an Indian thought, an Indian innovation, and ultimately leading to this kind of a world-class system on which today we are pioneers. This is just to give an example of the type of things. Another thing is regarding the test bench. You know, when, when you build your satellite, one is, of course, the users in India use it. And that is the best way to testify whether they are satisfied with you or not. You, there are many cases where you build a technological system, they are indigenous system, sometimes built for reasons of patriotism, and at the same time to look back into how they were used and how well they have integrated itself into the India's uh, developmental or other kinds of requirements, you would see sometimes not so satisfactory situations. 
and uh, so here he said here is a requirement we are where you are consistent constantly and consistently exposed to a large user community within the country who ask for the best who ask for systems which are comparable or even better than what others look for elsewhere so in the process you have to require provide those kind of services and they are really ultimately the judges of the product that you create this was one of the major uh, uh, thing on which uh, we had to really face uh, but i should say that so far the remote sensing program is one in which using this kind of systems the indian user community it not only has been satisfied but it has created a very large user community across a wide spectrum of resource activity in the country on the other side today the same systems are being used all across the world for example the indian remote sensing satellite on a commercial basis they receive data around something like 14 to 15 countries across the globe including united states and europe so and they find this as a unique piece of information on the resource management so we have virtually today we have a monopoly over something like 25% of the data that is being sold in the remote sensing market uh, from all over the world so one can see the importance of this kind of a capability and where we stand another way to benchmark the communication a similar thing happened uh, the intelsat the consortium of uh, satellite operators who provide communication services across the world they came to us about 10 years back in 94 and asked us whether we could provide the services of the insat system for the asia pacific region and they would like to hire transponders and they said that we need something like 10 transponders the total cost of this they were willing to give for 10 years something like 10 100 million dollars it is a great challenge because the type of specification the intelsat put probably is probably the most stringent in terms of anywhere in the world and we had to meet that through our insat system its outreach had to include also europe russia and so on and at the same time they wanted a satellite which has a lifetime of 10 years because that sense that makes economic sense for them they can't keep replacing it every 5 years or 6 years so this kind of a challenge was thrown on us we took up this challenge we built a satellite that is the insat 2e and yesterday i'm sure that you would have had a chance to see the insat 2e it it has been providing a true challenge in controlling it in the recent times but the fact is that it is now 7 years since it has been launched uh, we succeeded we provided them the satisfactory services and we truly really provided us with a global benchmark which ultimately propelled isro again into a commercial world where others who are interested in these kind of services accepted us at the same level in terms of technology in terms of reliability in terms of performance with respect to communication system space based communication system so this is another example of how do you calibrate and how do you evaluate your own capability vis-a-vis the world systems and also put yourself in the front uh, to be challenged in terms of the ability to deliver similar specifications this is the second and this is another test bed for our own capability the third one is a strategy which we had to adopt with respect to technology Uh, this is a challenge again and i would like to go with the one of the very very much widely discussed issue that of the technology transfer on the cryogenic engine it's a, it's a, it's 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 almost 10 years now it's almost 15 years 50 it's touching 15 years the whole idea was that uh, we have a rocket which has got different stages if you put in the upper stage A, a engine which is based on cryogenic technology the overall efficiency of the uh, injection is considerably improves uh, you you know the upper stage imparts almost 45% of the final velocity of the satellite so if you can increase improve the efficiency of that system that every, every, that system then you have an enormous capability improvement for the payload or the or what you call as a satellite weight and every kilogram of satellite that you put into the remote communication altitudes is equal to $25000 so there is a tremendous economics in terms of putting it into the orbit so your whole idea is to improve the capability of the rocket and increasing improving the capability here means that you have to have a very efficient upper stage and the upper stage it so happened the most efficient upper stage today available is a stage which uses liquid oxygen liquid hydrogen and these are extremely difficult technology simply because you deal with liquid hydrogen 
20 degrees Kelvin, liquid oxygen 60, 62 degrees Kelvin. Then you have to use with turbo pumps which are there in the pump which generate the necessary power for the propulsion of the rocket. It has to have something like 40 to 60,000 RPM. You know, our turbo pumps that we are familiar with is 600 RPM. And you talk of a turbo pump which deals with 40,000 to 60,000 RPM. And that too, it pumps in high liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. So obviously you can see the temperature demands on this, the material demands on this. So this whole complex complexity of the cryogenic system is the one that has been plaguing and so many countries have failed in developing this and those countries which have really succeeded ultimately guarded that zealously because it's a very strategic and very important know-how so far as they are concerned. India went into the global market to find out whether we could acquire an upper stage for our GSLV, the geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle. Uh, we had uh, offers from United States, we had from France, we had from Soviet Union. Uh, but ultimately we found that the technology transfer arrangements were not easily workable with United. They were just willing to sell you and that too at a cost which was incredibly high. Because you have to pay a price for high technology when they know it's not available elsewhere. It's not that the actual value of the technology is the value is very much dependent on its strategic capability as well as how easily it is available in the international market. So they quoted an exorbitant price which was simply unaffordable for India. France was a little better, but they were not willing to give the technology. So we finally went to the Russian Soviets, and the Soviets were reasonable in terms of providing us the uh, engines and the stages, and at the same time willing to transfer the technology, but the technology part of it got into a deadlock because of the missile technology controlled regimes, which the U.S. Uh, said that comes into picture in selling a whole stage of a rocket, even though nobody uses today cryogenic engines for missiles, and that's a very... Uh, difficult route uh, to use uh, use as a missile uh, system, but nevertheless uh, they had they had a reason not to give this kind of a capability to other countries. So ultimately, we had to buy it. There was only a buy buying arrangement and no technology transfer. But we decided that at that, that point that we will go ahead with a fine a system which is comparable to what they are going to supply us or even better. But the important part of it is ISRO never lost sight of these kind of requirements well ahead of time. By 80s itself, we started investing into the cryogenic. We knew that it is ultimately the path for a higher efficient system in the upper stage. So 80s, well before the decision on buying this uh, technology was taken, India's ISRO engineers had already wetted their hands with respect to this technology. Ten years they had worked on that indigenous route of a one ton thing. Ultimately you need seven and a half tons for this, but one ton it gives you a tremendous feel of how to deal with this. And that investment well ahead of time before you went into the international market to look for the technology helped us very much. So when the Russians finally supplied us with the engines, with the, with the stages, we were very much in the picture in terms of our own confidence to develop a parallel system. And in the next 10 years, between 1991 and 2001, we completed the indigenous development of a cryogenic engine, which has successfully been tested. And right now, it is on the threshold of testing in a stage, which they, the ISRO now claims that it will fly it in the next year or two. So it is reasonably within the type of time frame in which the international community has developed similar engines. So, but the important thing is an investments into those kind of advanced technology, visualizing their util utilities at 10 years or 15 years ahead, and ensuring that you have a certain capability in that area. Because without a certain base capability in a particular technology, a technology transfer from outside is meaningless. Because then you look for the next stage and next stage. If you want to convert a certain technology that is available to you to the next stage or the next generation, obviously you should have an indigenous ability to absorb that technology, to retune it, and ultimately build the new generation system. We did this in INSAT. We have now did it in the cryogenic technology. This gives you a little idea of the type of planning that goes into behind uh, well ahead of time, not just uh, yesterday or today, uh, but years ahead, visualizing that certain things have to happen. And this is where the strategic planning in this country certainly needs to be strengthened up because most of the time, the time frame for a decision is applicable for one or two years. Things change and you are lost. This just, we can't afford it in the new, we have areas where those kind of decisions have to be certainly pursued. 
with time frames of one year, two year because of the dynamic changes. But there are areas where it's a very painful process of an evolution. And if you have to have a strong base, and if you have to have a, be a, a world leader, obviously you need capabilities on which the planning has to be years and years, sometimes decades, in terms of visualizing, pursuing, and uh, solving. The, this is, these are all but uh, a few of the uh, examples of the challenges we faced on the technology, technology transfer, the international regimes, and so on. I just now go into a few things before I conclude my talk. Uh, one is on the management system of uh, ISRO. Uh, you know, ISRO, uh, ISRO had, for example, even 15 years back, uh, a budget of 600 crores and something like uh, 15,000 employees. Today it has grown to 4,000 crores, but it does still have the same number of people. And it's not that uh, the 15,000 employees at the time when the 600 crores was the budget, there was an over uh, recruitment. It was not for certain many types of job, you need certain number of people as a critical mass. So obviously that was taken into account. But what helped us to manage the program even today within the limits of the certain number of people in creating limited amount of infrastructure inside and at the same time to take larger budget, make the program bigger, wider in scope, was the fact that we used the networking principle of several capabilities in the country or even build up the capability in the country. One is in the area of industry. The industrial interface has been a very successful uh, interface in the, with, with, with ISRO. And probably one of the unique ones, we have something like 500 industries which work with us uh, in the space program, uh, something like uh, 15 of them major industries, and uh, some of them are medium and some of them are minor industries. They go from manufacturing, assembly, testing, and so on. And today they have also gone into the system. In fact, the HAL now started developing the entire second stage of the ISRO's uh, PSLV is now de developed and delivered by HAL. So that is, that is the way in which the industrial base, creation of an industrial base is very critical for this country. For one reason, of course, it reduces your own load of management. You can have a substantial deployment of resources outside if you give money. And for the launch vehicle, 65% of our launch vehicle budget goes into the Indian industry. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is you also upgrade the industry's capability in the country. When you look for a space system to be built in the industry, you need to have capability in terms of quality assurance, in terms of precision engineering, in terms of materials management, in each one of them, there is a high-tech culture that you bring into the industry. The industry, what it does is it transfers this culture into other routine products. And you have a product which is of a much higher value and a much higher quality than what otherwise conventionally is turned out. So you have this whole cycle operating today within the industry because of the input from the high-tech uh, uh, requirements. It is not only ISRO, but also you know the atomic energy uses industries uh, very much. And similarly, we have the linkages with the R&D institutions. We have the Institute of Science with IITs, with the research and development laboratories like the National Aerospace Laboratories. Many of these institutions provide the research and development support. You can have research and development people. Today, ISRO has something like 5,000 engineers with PhD, MTechs, and BTechs. But you can't keep on increasing this kind of numbers beyond a point. Of course, the policy now is to increase more number of people at the higher level and to keep reducing the people at the lower level and make the lower work given more and more outside. So that policy is working well. But even then, you have a larger repository of human resource in the area of research and development in aeronautics and aerospace across the country in several institutions. One of the important things that ISRO has done over the years is to network with them. The third is, of course, the governmental system. I talked about the institutional framework, about uh, the ICC, the, the NNRMS, the ADCOS, and so on, the governmental mechanisms at the center. Uh, but, uh, but that is another thing that has successfully worked. Uh, but today, the, another important component of the operators are the private people who provide support, like the VSAT operators uh, who come forward and who want to have bandwidth, vector bandwidth from the satellite. So there are policies which have been dynamically changed. In fact, today's communication policy for the space communication policy has been changed to the point until a uh, few years back, only government could establish satellite systems in the country. Only government could operate the satellite capacity in the country. 
and uh, so there was no means in the private operators could really use Indian systems. Now those have been all changed. Private people can invest money into space systems. They can operate satellite systems which are privately owned and registered in India. And when I say if it is registered in India, it means that you have to the government has to take the responsibility of coordinating the slot in which these kind of satellites are put. It is a national registration requirement. And also there are questions which are related to third party liability and so on in the world of uh, the conventions and treaties and the government assumes the responsibility for it, the internal mechanism to ensure that the private operators also conform to some of these disciplines have been already set in place. Of course, so far the private operators have substantially used the insight capacity. They find it more prudent to do that than to own satellite by themselves. So most of the, the satellites are today still owned by ISRO, uh, but I, am, I, I do foresee in the coming years uh, substantial ownership of satellite system by several private investors in the country and the policy changes uh, that could take place. On the international cooperation, and I'm sure you'd be interested and you have been associated, uh, there have been a tremendous, the space has been an instrument uh, for international cooperation. Uh, this is not only in the context of our bilateral cooperation with the several agencies across the world, the space agencies, but equally importantly between the country to country, the Ministry of External Affairs would call us suddenly and say, why don't we go with Belgium, why don't we go with Mauritius, why don't you set up a ground station in Burma? So, you know, these kind, they, they have their own broader policy and a provision in developing bilateral relations and uh, the high technology capability of India, particularly in areas like space, ultimately is used as an instrument for furthering the cooperation and understanding and this has worked very well. We have established several capabilities in different countries both in the third world, in the developing world as well as in the developed world uh, thanks to this uh, broader outlook of the government in establishing relationships where say, space, space has been one of the centerpieces. Commerce, we have more recently entered into the world of commerce. I said that the, the program even today is by and large directed and driven by the societal needs of the country and developmental needs of the country. But then as the program goes, you create a certain capacity within the country, whether it is within ISRO or outside through so the industries and other institutions, it's a different matter. But you have a capacity. And when you have a capacity, you have a higher throughput capability. When you have a higher throughput capability, obviously you would like to offer that in terms of commercial products to other countries. So here is again, we have been now able to provide satellite services. I said about 15 ground stations across the world receive data uh, from the Indian remote sensing satellite. The communication satellites like 2E provide uh, uh, several transponder capacity. This is another way to, on the commercial side. The inter and then there are, of course, uh, many launch requirements which are being discussed currently. So there are several ways in which the commercial capabilities are being further strengthened uh, in terms of uh, the, the capabilities are being strengthened through the commercial arrangements. But I should say, unlike many other areas in commerce, it is not only the quality and the money that matters in the world of commerce when it comes to space. There has to be a political will from the country which agrees with you to sign this kind of agreement. And in fact, sometimes your price can be nearly 30-40% lower than uh, your competitor. But that government takes a deliberate decision that we would go with that country because the political equation with India is not that good. So there, are, there have been several such instances where we have been denied contracts in the launch in giving us satellite contracts, even though from technological and other consider financial consideration, we were far, far superior, but we couldn't uh, get it. The other part of the commercial arrangements are when you try to give more and more launch opportunities, for example, the America stopped to both China and India, the ability to launch the satellites built anywhere in the world which uses American components. They said that you can't use it simply because of the fact every satellite virtually carries American component because that is the cheapest and the best technology that you have there. Their throughput is so high that they are probably the only source. Today Europe is also becoming a parallel, developing a parallel autonomy in space components. But these are very specialized components and they put this restriction. So many countries have to either go to Europe or to United States for the launch. Even though the launch costs are extremely high, if they have to build a satellite which has to use the American components, that means if they have to own a satellite, obviously they have to abide by this. 
The reason is not far from one is one is of course it gives a more impetus to the U.S. Com commercial entities to get a better launch opportunity. But equally important that if you increase your throughput of capability of your own launches, you improve your rockets, you improve your optimization, you therefore improve and when there is a larger number you can bring down the cost, you can bring down the technology and when you bring up the technology and when you bring up the technology it has its own other ramifications in terms of the country's ability in many other programs. So these are all recognized as the reason why the commerce also suffers and this is unique to program like uh, is space because the dimensions of uh, the commerce are not purely one in which uh, you decide it on technical and financial considerations which is much more than that. The other part of it is the space uh, role. It has, be, it has been a very satisfactory arrangement in the country to have the space coming under the Prime Minister. The successive, for example, in my own tenure I had to work with four successive Prime Ministers. You had Narasimha Rao, you had Deva Gowda, you had Indrajit, I.K. Gujaral and Vajpayee Ji. So you had four of them. Uh, but each one of them, one, one thing that was very clear on the space program is they were very deeply committed to the program. I'm bringing this uh, because the, the support from the political system is extremely critical in these kind of areas. And this is an area, as I said, started with that they are risky. So you need political support because things could also go wrong. In this, like things goes right in the space. So if things go wrong, you need support because you, you just cannot, you, you, the whole thing can be put off if a couple of failures occur and you say that you are incapable of running a space program. So you need this. And these people had a vision which is much beyond just looking at the program by itself. They understood and appreciated the complexities. They understood and appreciated the risks that are involved and therefore understood the importance of morale within the organization and that it has to be kept up. And uh, they were all equally enthusiastic in visiting centers, participate in major events, and uh, try to be present at the launch center when the launch takes place. But these are all important indicators of this. The same thing has happened. Promotion of space within the states is another major area. And here the role of chief ministers and the bureaucracy within the state has been very important. But ultimately you have to develop those linkages with the states too. So this is another major area in which ISRO has developed excellent uh, institutional systems as well as contacts with the state machinery to ensure that the space system is because there are several subjects which are state subjects or on the concurrent list. So obviously you have to make sure that uh, they are as much important and uh, brought into the picture as uh, you have in the center. I would say even though it may look trivial, the importance of media. Uh, media, you know, the science and technology area is one area where many times the scientists fight shy of speaking to the media. And the media can be both very encouraging and very devastating. And it all depends on the flown again and what the reason was, what the problems are. So after informing the Prime Minister, I knew that there were something like 200 uh, members of the media sitting in the Vikram, in Pramprakash Hall in the Srihari Kota Center. And they were drawn not only from India, but from all over the world. You had BBC, CNN, and, and many other kind of things. But uh, they can all carry a wrong message all over the world about the program if you don't tell them what the situation was on that day. I went, the moment I talked to Prime Minister and Prime Minister was very encouraging and said that you should uh, now think calmly and put everything properly into, and then I am sure you will find a solution to this. Went to the media and told them that this has happened, we have aborted the launch. And then they asked, when are you going to launch again? I said, I cannot say anything. Maybe it will be a few weeks, few months. Or I don't know what it is because without knowing the technical problem and this looks to be also I also didn't want to be wishy-washy told them a little bit of what we suspect as a problem which was really the problem but we at that time told them this is uh, this is suspect to be but I, I should say that they were absolutely objective in reporting next day it was it carried as a headline in most of the papers but they were all very objective and there has been never any speculation about what happened. And so no speculatory articles, no speculative editorials, but only a little bit of, sometimes you get a left-handed compliment also in the whole process. They said that, uh, and of course, like many other things who subsequently analyzed this problem, they said that ISRO has not only uh, uh, mastered the art of launching successfully, they have also successfully mastered the art of aborting a launch without destroying the launcher. And that is an extremely complex thing, mind you. Yeah, as a technologist, I can say 
that to, to, to pull down the burning engine, cut off the fuels to that and do it in a sequence in seconds and ultimately put off the rocket and save it is not a simple thing. It's a, it's a hardware and software challenge of an incredible magnitude, as much complex as designing the rocket itself. But that was demonstrated. It was not that we wanted to demonstrate it there, but it happened in the whole process. So, but, but, so this was actually, I, I understood the American Astronautics and Aeronautics Journal wrote in its editorial, the Indians not only seem to have mastered the art of launching rockets very precisely, but they have also mastered this very intricate art of aborting a launch. Very few countries have, we have demonstrated this. So, you know, that is the kind of a thing. Sometimes it, it, you could treat it as a left-handed compliment or it could be a compliment. But the, but the importance of media, I don't want to understate. Uh, it's extremely, but dealing with them also, one has to be a little careful. But I think we had good experience in talking to them and trying to ensure that uh, they project in the way in which uh, things are the thing. I, I could only now sum up the whole thing. Uh, I, I, these are all I, as I have seen it. So it is, it is not the total story. It is limited by my own understanding of the total way in which it evolved. Uh, but, but I should say one thing. I worked with these uh, three predecessors of mine. And I have to give a little characteristics of them in the, in the context of the professional way. I worked with Sarabhai as a student. Uh, as I said, that he was an extraordinary person with a tremendous vision, extremely easy to access, very sporting, easy to say what you want. You can be, you can, you can be very free with it. So you feel very comfortable uh, to work with such a person. So that is the first part of it, that you can work with big bosses and we still be very comfortable with them, even though they may be demanding. Then came Sadish Dhawan. He was a professor, you know, he was the director of the Institute of Science. He was a hardcore professor, a PhD from Caltech in aeronautics. And uh, so he was a man with pension for precision. Everything has to be very precise, very accurately analyzed. Pros and cons have to be understood. And he is one person who was never satisfied with the one route of solution. He would always ask, what are the other options available to you? And why did you choose this option compared to the other option? So you have to go with him with thorough homework. Otherwise, you will simply come out with one more option which you are not thought and you will feel that you have not done your homework. So, but, but then he is so demanding. But he created that thinking of perfection in the organization. And his reviews were most, people were really afraid to face him in the reviews. Uh, you will have to present the case. And you know, ISRO has this culture of reviews where periodically every project is reviewed at the project director's level, at deputy director, central director, at chairman's level. And chairman's level, once in three months at least, every major project gets reviewed. And this, these chairmen are not uh, dummy chairmen of the coming and sitting and only looking at the managerial issue of why did you not spend the budget here and why did you not put a manpower there. That is, that is not the question that are asked. Hardcore technical questions are asked. And many times these hardcore questions are more difficult than the fellow who is really designing that system because you go prepared. And so these, so Davan introduced this culture. And also interesting aspect of the technical system and the review is that that is one forum in which anybody can ask a question. It's not important that the engineer is only one year into his row or 10 years into his row or 20 years. The fellow who may be making a presentation of his system design may be 20 years veteran. And that guy may be just one year. He can stand up and say, sorry, sir, you are one equation. That term is missing and there is something wrong with it. And if he's not able to answer, the chairman will immediately interject and you better look at it and give, send me an answer for that. So that is the kind of a culture where everybody could uh, are equal technically. Hierarchically, in terms of administration, you would have a structure. But technically, anybody had the freedom to talk and give their views and participate critically in areas like reviews. So this really is an important uh, culture, uh, which is important. So he encouraged this kind of a thing. And, uh, but, but then he introduced this, not only he, he introduced a kind of a, a perfection in thinking and a professionalism in the way in which you manage. He also introduced the institutional mechanism, which ultimately made possible ISRO to function. You know, today, when you launch a satellite, you launch it and because it was an internal decision. And then say, now what do we, I will have to now go around the country and find out who is going to use it. That doesn't arise at all. It has been planned five years ahead. The, the, the user has been identified. The level of requirements has been specified. And our job is to ensure that it is put in that time, in, in the, with that money, and ultimately meeting the specification to his satisfaction. So that is what makes the program. And again, he introduced that discipline into that system. 
the third man with whom i worked was you are wrong he he had a very interesting way of looking at things he never believed that things has to be done tomorrow why not today so anything he wanted to do tomorrow he had to do it today so it was even more difficult to work with him and you know when uh, davan suggested to him he was the director why don't we build this satellite aryabhat the first of the satellite for the country had to build and you better do it in uh, 24 months rather 30 months he said sir we will do it in 24 months and believe it or not it was done in 30 months from uh, probably it will be a ki- kind of a guinness book record simply because we didn't have the manpower we didn't have the know how and we had to build a satellite and it has to be launched within 30 months after creating the necessary infrastructure in bangalore but this was all done so that that is the kind of people that we had to lead so when i was assigned the task my task was now whom should i emulate whom should i be uh, following so i did make i didn't jump into managing isro for the next few days the first task that was assigned was it was a saturday in which i took over on april 1st 1994 and um, uh, i understood i was told immediately by the headquarters that monday we had to appear before the parliamentary standing committee so that i think that the worst that a chair, new chairman could expect and uh, so saturday and sunday we worked furiously at everything and uh, my concerns was not so much the presentation all of us can do presentation but the question is the type of questions these mps will ask and try to pull your leg and i know now what it means from sitting on the other side too uh, so but the but the fact remains that uh, they were they were there but then we prepared very hard and we anticipated a lot of questions we had put down all the type of questions they may ask and we also reviewed the last one year trend in questions all these were also reviewed and we finally went and uh, all that happened is monday morning i got up i took two glasses of water and straight walked into that room to give the test uh, to to give this uh, evidence and uh, of course 20 minutes they allowed us to make a presentation which i did i think it was satisfactory and then the rest of the one hour was spent in a lot of questions left and right there were firing questions but somehow we could withstood it withstand it and uh, i came out uh, i thought i felt uh, that i think the first milestone has been crossed in isro so that was a very interesting experience but subsequently giving a little talk for the next few days i knew that it, it is at the present point at the point of 94 to the coming years it is not good enough to follow one or the other of them you need to get the best of the characteristics of all of them and then also to find you need with respect to the requirements so somehow i made a, a cocktail of approaches which is a kind of a combination and a, of the various approaches that these three had adopted and uh, i think of course uh, the, the the proof the the, the proof to be the, if you ask me how much did it work ultimately i think 10 years later when i left the organization in what state it is probably the only one that will speak of whether the strategy of getting the best of these people's characteristics has been useful to me or not so i don't want to answer that part of it all i have to say is is a very interesting job the chairman being a chairman of isro and i always uh, try to look at it as uh, something like uh, the trinity the brahma and vishnu and shiva why this trinity you know brahma is the creator and uh, so he creates the world and in isro you have to create programs if you have to be not only relevant to the country development you have to also be in the public eye you have to keep creating programs and interesting programs programs uh, which are applicable which could be uh, which which would catch the eye of the nation in terms of its utility like the jusat and so on so you have to do this so the chairman's one job is the brahma's job of creation the next is of course the preservation which is vishnu's job because you know you you there will be several ways in which uh, things can get derailed because the internal programs are so complex the management is so complex and the dimensions are so many that so you have to have a very balanced view of uh, preservation approach which will ensure that uh, you are not derailed either through internal problems or through external influences that's a challenge by itself so that's role of the vishnu but if you allow both these to operate without any inhibition 
ISRO would have been today a, a 1 billion to a 10 billion dollar kind of a program with 500,000 people and unmanageable and no every day the paper is only writing about the waste of taxpayers money so you need a certain control you should have a pragmatic approach of what to delete what has outlived their usefulness and what has to be so you need to have a certain destructive mentality it is not a destructive in the sense of Shiva's role as a distractor but more important is how do you take away programs or delete programs which have outlived their universe. So you have to have that. Uh, the fact that ISRO continues to be a 15,000 organization even though the budget has gone to 4,000 and have still a vibrancy in the way in which you approach the program, it looks to me that all the three are operating successfully and in synergy. Thank you. One is, of course, the, the areas like uh, the social component, uh, as I said, they need to be strengthened. Uh, when I say strengthen, for example, the remote sensing satellite today are optical. We need to put in microwave systems. Uh, microwave systems are essentially complex in technology, but they are the ones who can see through the cloud. You can have a day-night observation capability and so on. So currently, that is one of the directions in the remote sensing. The second is to look at uh, programs uh, like uh, 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 navigation. The satellite navigation is an extremely important thing. Currently, it is all dependent on the NAVSTAR, the global positioning system of the United States. We need to have something where we have a little more autonomy, not in the context of building our own system, but at least making sure that it is not totally under military control. You know, the GS, GPS system, even though U.S. has guaranteed that, we still, so we think that we will go with the Galileo in Europe and also we are attempting to see whether we should have another program where we build a regional system with Russia. So that is, that is another major thing, but it would involve putting multiple systems in a constellation mode for lo position location on the ground. So this is another major program. The third major program, of course, is the missions to the planet. Actually, the long-term vision of ISRO is to develop capability for planetary exploration but not necessarily as a standalone program of the nation, but building it as an international cooperative network. But towards that, you have to qualify yourself to be in that league. So the first lunar mission is going to do that particular job. The lunar mission itself has an international component with instruments coming from the United States and Europe. But uh, it will be much more when we try to move towards from the moon. The, the second portion of the moon could be a lander. The third could be an orbi uh, to a, a sample return. A fourth could be a mission which could go to Mars or a Venus, depend the, the definition is still on. And ultimately, of course, to create bases outside. So this is the third direction. The fourth one will be to be a part of the space station. Currently, we don't think that is good for it is necessary for us to build a space station on our own because of the type of money. But again, here we could be a partner, international partner, we could send our own astronauts. And equally important, we can build modules which can be fitted to the space station and make it our own laboratory as a part of the overall space station. This is a fourth one. And uh, fifth one, of course, uh, would be to play a more proactive role in terms of uh, the ability of the states to provide a strategic capability for the country on which uh, we are trying to look at it. Maybe it may have a larger role in the coming years in terms of this. This is just to give you a flavor of the type of things that we should be doing in the coming years. Well, the regional is coming up. You know, the Europeans have now got the ESA, and the ESA is also transforming itself under the EU the European Union. So that will be one way. They have brought together several countries of the euro into fold. China is trying to form a similar nexus in this region. We rightly have not endorsed it. No, no, common goal is the United Nations Forum. That's all I can say. United Nations Committee of Outer Space Affairs, the UN COPUS, 
has uh, a, this is a forum where 62 or 63 countries are represented and they debate the common issues like orbital for sharing policies related to remote sensing of various countries providing space capability for development for the third world and uh, questions related to carrying of nuclear reactors in space the ethics of uh, space utilization. So there are a lot of things which are, or you, whether the planetary exploration should be a part of a common heritage of the humankind. So these kind of things, uh, they are all debated in the United Nations Forum. So that's it. Yeah, I think we have a few more questions we can have. Let us just follow in order. Mr. Vijay Bhaskar, please. I had personal experience of the proactive nature of ISRO in trying to reach out to user community. And we utilized uh, your, your remote sensing uh, capabilities to a large extent in our World Bank aided watershed program. Right now we are uh, using the EDUSAT uh, satellite for satellite uh, education programs. But I find that uh, in this sense, uh, the satellite, the ground capability, because each school requires about one lakh investment for, the, for it to receive the educational transmission. But the satellite is up there, but since we do not have enough money to invest in school infrastructure, in providing one lakh per school, the entire capability of the satellite is not being used. Because we have, uh, it is with help of ISRO, we have uh, taken up uh, Chamaraj Nagar. It has proved a big success, but we want to expand it to other districts, but because the state government does not have enough funds to invest at school level, and the government of India is also not coming forward through Saro Sikshagan to invest it. So we find that even though the satellite is there, we are not able to fully utilize it. How do we solve this? Well, no, I, I don't think that uh, that, is a, that is an issue to be worried about. When we de decided to go for an EJUSAT, uh, we had a presentation to the Human Resource uh, Development regarding uh, the EJUSAT and its capability. And you know the EJUSAT has got several dimensions to its utilization, uh, teachers' uh, training, uh, primary education, secondary and tertiary education, which is not curriculum based but enrichment. Uh, then professional training, which could be enrichment. Curriculum based to professional training. So there are several, and then distance education, where IGNU and other kinds of uh, uh, institutions, Ambedkar University in Maharashtra, they, can, they could make use of it, or Rajiv Gandhi in, so University in Madhya Pradesh. The whole idea is here, or you did it for the VTVU, you did 100 you know, 100 colleges in Karnataka made use of it in the VTVU experiment. Uh, but the most important thing is that we did when we made a presentation, you know, the challenges are more related to uh, ground systems and software. Because the software has to be locale specific, even language specific in most of the cases. And we did make an estimate that if you have to use uh, a juice, uh, what it would mean in terms of a ground investment. And we did find that the ground investment could be anywhere up to 10,000 to 12,000 crores. So obviously it was understood even at the time of the launching that it will have to ramp up over years. And since the satellite has a lifetime of something like 10 years, the final ramping up can take even in the 10th year. So how do you want to face it and start using it is something with the HRD has to work out with the concerned agencies who are involved in the education, not only at the center but also at the state. So this is a very major task and we have even suggested a, a kind of an institutional framework to do this where you can have a, a satellite education authority or something where you try to bring in the several activities which are involved in distance education, high university education, higher secondary education and so on. You bring them all together and try to examine and, and work out an integrated plan because satellite ultimately is the converging point for several diverse activities that go under the name of the education today, and particularly the distance education. So that is to be worked out. The HRD has to take that initiative. We are trying to push it from our side. But you know, there is a limit to which we can be proactive in using the full capacity of the EJUSAT. It has to come from this. But we didn't at the same time want a concept like this to go uh, uh, delayed in the context of countries increasing needs on education. Uh, but I should say that there are many other non-formal systems which are already asking the capacity. The policy is not uh, clear as to whether the non-formal agencies could also use it, in which case there would be a substantial increase in the capacity. 
but the first opportunity is for the government agencies uh, to use it and uh, use it for the education. I do agree with you that the ground investments has not been as, uh, as much as one would have liked even in the last one year. There could have been more. But uh, that is something that needs several agencies to do together. Mr. Surin Rao, please. Uh, Mr. Vijay Bhaskar, there are two, three questions. Let's come back to the next round. Mr. Surin Rao, please. Sir, we are very proud of ISRO's achievements. I think there are many things that ISRO has done to make the nation proud of its achievements. A couple of questions. How many years are we away from a manned launch? And the second, why have we not put up a defense uh, or a spy satellite to prevent situations like Kargil? Thank you, sir. Well, so far as manned mission is concerned, if you are talking of our own ability to put a manned mission, we should do it in about eight to ten years is the kind of time frame in which we can do with a budget which is roughly twice the present budget of ISRO. That is about 12 to 13,000, maybe 20,000 crores. So that part of it is that we need the necessary nut and bolts to do that is already there. When we talk of a GSLV, in fact, the GSLV Mark III, Mark IV, no, Mark III, is the heavy air lift vehicle, launch vehicle, which will go up in 2007-2008. It has also been manned rated, which essentially means you have a slow takeoff, got the necessary reliability features, redundancy features, and so on. That has been done. The various other technologies which are related to a capsule in terms of thermal control structure and so on, that capability exists. Where we don't have a capability currently is a closed-loop uh, life cycle system. So one has to learn a little bit out of that, which we could do even with a cooperative arrangement with countries like Russia. So that is the third part of it. And lastly, a political decision as to whether India should go with an expenditure which is uh, 20,000 crores kind of a thing. This has not been a new thing. The, the politicians have often raised this question. When I was there, Bajpa used to come back to this question very often. When are we going to send a man up in space? It is not that they are not uh, overlooking the potentiality of a good fallout out of such a decision. But I think that parallelly the nation should also be prepared for a large investment, a upscaling of the program which is substantial compared to the present one, and uh, then a sustainability of that system over the years in terms of a consistent investment, which is not that easy. In fact, it becomes a white elephant in space, and you don't know what to do with it after putting it up there. Then you had it. In fact, even space station today, they are really looking at how to keep it going in the coming years. So that's where it is. So far as the spy satellite is concerned, I mean, ISRO's uh, capability is no problem. Requirements, uh, if it is projected, is uh, certainly responded to. And I can assure you that uh, I don't think we have lacked in response. Yes, Mr. Venkatesh Rao. Sir, what are the spin-offs in other fields from the space program, other than the utilities, what we are seeing? Well, you know, ISRO has a uh, arrangement to look at uh, what could be the advantages of some of the technologies we have developed in other areas. There is a program of converting these products and processes into areas where it could be taken advantage on the day-to-day -day life. For example, materials. The material that was developed for rockets were used also for developing synthetic uh, skin, for example, for earrings or dentures, or Jaipur foot, so those kind of a thing. The mechanism, the, the, the development of electronic systems, particularly data processing and so on, they have been used in a variety of process control and many other kind of equipments. If you look at image processing processes which are related to the remote sensing, we have worked with hospitals to look at the medical imaging and improving the, you know, if you look at uh, some of the medical, the imaging features, uh, if you try to improve it by means of suitable processing algorithms, you can start looking at signatures, for example, in an electrocardiogram, which is not obviously visible. So there are areas in which we have worked with the hospitals to do this. And uh, ulti ultimately, of course, uh, uh, something like 200 or 250 products uh, 
of ISRO has been translated into marketable products outside the space requirements. And today there are many companies which make use of these products for uh, uh, commercialization. And we charge a nominal royalty for that, that's all. Dr. Manjunath. Sir, uh, introduction of new technologies and their application may also demand uh, introduction of new laws. Yes. Uh, yesterday also we were debating in uh, Asan. Uh, one is somebody trying to damage our systems or somebody overlapping in our regions, uh, particularly referring to the Google pictures that are made available just like that. Uh, are there any laws or is there any role by ISRO on to this preparation of these laws, sir? Laws are there up to a point. Today things are moving fast. For example, the, 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 these are actually formulated as international treaties, conventions and agreements. This is in, within the United Nations. So if you talk about a Google kind of a thing, there are, there are uh, UN conventions and treaties where a remote sense, what is the uh, ownership of a remotely sensed data on the third countries? Whether the third country have a right to ask for those information. So first thing is that you have to declare that uh, you are taking the image over a third country. Second, that if they want those images of their country, not others, other information, then you are bound to give. This is, this is already there in the law. But how many uh, countries are willing to declare that they, can, they are taking the pictures over the other countries? That is, that is a question. So some of them are th there for the sake of a psychological satisfaction that you are protected, but it may not be so. So that is one kind of a law. The second kind of a thing is, you know, the bandwidth that you arrive in the space is like the bandwidth on the ground. You have uh, communications, it is used for communication, it is used for remote, it is used for broadcasting, it is used for messaging, used for many other telex and all kinds of things. Now, which essentially means the same bandwidth could be used in a convergent mode. So the loss related to the convergence is another major area on which a lot of discussion is going on. But then you need to bring in correspondingly the changes in the administrative setup. Uh, we have to see a broadcasting ministry and the communication ministry. How do we bring them together? So that there are, these are two big ministries headed by two big people. So there are, there are questions of that kind. That is another kind of a thing. But there is a law can be brought in. There is no problem. Uh, the, the, th the, third, the third thing is the legal framework for, in, under which you can book your slot you can own the slot up to a certain point. You operate certain frequencies without interference. So those kind of things, there are procedures and conventions today available. And we are very strict adherent to this. Dr. Vijay uh, let's continue this discussion a little later. Dr. Vijay Raghavan, please. Sir, you talked about aborting the launching at particular, particular stage when, the, when you detect any problem. You can immediately abort it. That means you keep a system already in the launching so that you can, be, you can abort it at any time. Why I am asking this question is there was, a, there was a debate regarding the failure of the Columbia flight. So at what stage they could abort it and how the life could have been saved? Yeah, you know, th these are two different types of uh, uh, things. One thing is to abort on the ground. The other thing is really aborting something in the sense that the astronauts could eject themselves out of the craft uh, which is getting into difficulty at the time of the re-entry. The aborting is possible in those cases only in the re-entry phase and that too in certain atmospheric altitudes. The, as soon as you jump out, you need to have a parachute, you need to have the parachute deployment and then a slow deceleration and a slow descent. So these are the requirements of which is normally so in the fighter aircrafts when the pilots try to bail out in the case of a problem with the aircraft. This was considered as a feature for the introducing a safety into the shuttle at one time. Uh, then they found there were two arguments, if I remember, this was almost three, two, two, three decades back. One argument was that uh, it will introduce quite a lot of complexities in the configuration of the shuttle. And uh, those complexities by itself will produce more unreliability to the shuttle. And therefore, they ruled it out. The other part of it is there was a substantial increase in the investments that are needed to enable that kind of a thing. 
and they found that uh, the reliability, they computed the reliability and all space people compute reliability very meticulously and say at the time of the launch, my satellite will, only thing they will never say reliability is one, that should never be said. 0.995 or 0.95, 0.99, that's, that's always there. So that kind of a number and they thought that there is only a very small probability of even an anomaly in once in 100 flights. Some, some, some number was turned out. So they found that it is good enough. The, all the features that are built in, other features, are such that uh, it will take care of it. But you know these engineering systems have a very interesting way of throwing up uh, surprises. When you fail, then you find that uh, there are a lot of things that uh, should have been looked in. It has happened in our case too. We have, most of the time, we have learned a lot of things by our design, testing and so on. But we have probably learned an equally good thing by our failures. So that part of it is, uh, it so happens that it is always so in the engineering systems. So in shuttle also they found out post facto Maybe some of these features would have been useful. But at this stage, to reconfigure it means as, well as, as good as building a new craft. Mr. Vijay Baski, you had a comment to add? Yeah, regarding the EDISET uh, programs, is it uh, possible to use it for radio instruction, for instance, in Karnataka? We yes, major, it can. It but, can. Uh, that I, I would uh, suggest that I mean, ISRO should also promote this because I was told this by some other person, but ISRO, we have not been actually told that this can be used for. Well, you should deal with them. I, know, I don't know what they are. But, but the, the, technologically, there are no difficulties in doing that through the radio. Ultimately, it's audio, video, dear, everything is possible. In fact, for radio, you need less of uh, bandwidth. But only thing is, you need a ground system which is initially can receive the KU band or extended C band. And then you have to do a down, down conversion. So there is some amount of uh, transformation of frequency that is involved on the ground. Because these are all done for broadcasting frequencies. So you, if you want to do it for the radio, you have to convert these frequencies into intermediate uh, frequencies, which will then be compatible with the standard radio. So there is an adopt, adopter that you need to create for that. Dr. Manchanad, you had something to add? I just wanted to continue. Uh, sir, within the our law, if we want to inhibit some sites not to be shown, is it possible, sir? Some strategic sites. We have to hide it and we can camouflage it with not suitable we, methods. Not we. Uh, when I told they are, we, we, we have to discuss Can we the take a legal action if somebody projects this? No, I, th I think it's going uh, to be difficult. Or yes, what I you can probably do, which, probably what you can do is to negotiate the, Lord, with the law do not permit any action against such parties, no. No, uh, to I, my knowledge, I may be wrong. Okay. I don't think that's going to be easy to take action. It could be only by a negotiation with them. Only thing is, since we have also a battery of uh, satellites, and many of which can give equally good pictures, we can look at some retaliatory measures also. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Kasturudankar, for you. such an inspiring and dynamic lecture on various aspects of this wonderful institution in our country. May I now invite uh, uh, Dr. Emma's Ishwaran, scientist from Center for Airborne Systems, a DRDO lab in Bangalore to give a formal vote of thanks to Dr. Rangan. Thank you, Sangeeta. Uh, technology is a must for progress of a country, no doubt about it. And uh, the technology is useless if it is not converted into a system on time and deployed for the usefulness of the society. And we in technology development and management, we know what are the difficulties we encounter when we start developing whether uh, the indigenous versus buy and uh, build buy or build act, uh, decisions which are very difficult to take i think isro has shown a very good uh, decision making process and uh, created an establishment i think which is an example for all the technology development and management establishments sir i thank you for giving us a very good insight into the uh, building of the isro and for this I think on behalf of all of us, thank you very much again. Thank you. We break for tea now. <laughs>